If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to start reading in verse 1. Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, we're going to talk about the three R's of authentic Christianity, the three R's of authentic Christianity. While you find Galatians chapter 5, going to begin reading in verse 1. Galatians 5 and verse 1, three R's of authentic Christianity. Paul says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. But we, through the Spirit, do eagerly await the righteousness that comes by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to come minister to us. Father, thank you for this morning. Father, I thank you for the people that you love so much. Father, thank you for your word. It is truth. Sanctify us by your truth. And Father, I pray that we would encounter you through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees with that, just say amen, amen. and amen. <clears throat> right now, we're reading Paul's letter to the new Christians in the region of Galatia, what is now modern-day Turkey. This is no ordinary letter. It is a letter from heaven, inspired by the Holy Spirit to speak to you and me. And the Holy Spirit has said a lot to us already, but today I want to perhaps try and nail the very heart of this amazing letter, which is the contrast between religion and authentic Christianity. Galatians 5 has some of the most sobering and some of the most shocking language in the New Testament. Paul says, don't let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. If you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you? As for those false teachers who want you to be circumcised, I wish they would just go the whole way and emasculate themselves. Yikes! You think I get ornery when I'm angry. Imagine if you had Paul for your pastor. You who are trying to be justified by law have been, listen, alienated from Christ. You have fallen from grace. What was the fundamental problem in the Galatian church? It's precisely the same problem that we face today. We have traded authentic Christianity for religion. Why has the church lost so much ground in America and in the Western world? It's because of religion. Why have we suffered so much embarrassment and disgrace over leaders and members behaving in ways that are so unchristlike? It's because of religion. Why is the church, by and large, not as spiritually powerful, nor as pure, nor as loving, nor as fruitful, nor as influential as the church that we read about in the book of Acts? It's because of religion. Now, I'm going to say something, and the 530 crowd last night turned ugly on me, but 830 was more spiritual, so they handled it, and I know you will too. Listen, the greatest threat to the survival of authentic Christianity is not saints falling into sin, but saints falling into religion. We'll deal with the issue of sin in a little bit. But listen, in Galatians 5, 4, falling from grace is not falling into sin, but rather falling into religion. In a sense, to fall into sin is to fall into grace if someone sincerely repents, but to fall into religion is to fall away from grace. Paul says here that religion is like a kink in your garden hose. It cuts off the flow of God's grace to you. From the Jerusalem that is above, there is a river 
that flows out from underneath the throne of God. The river is God's own presence. The river is the very life of God. The river cleanses. The river revives. The river brings healing. The river brings peace. The river brings overflowing joy. The river makes you abundantly fruitful. When by faith in the cross you become united to Christ, that river flows to you. The river flows over you. It flows around you. It flows in you. It flows through you. Floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart. But if your faith in Christ turns into religion, a great big old kink goes in the garden hose and it cuts off that life-giving flow of salvation. If your faith turns into religion, the wonderful benefits of Christ are cut off from you. If your faith turns into religion, you are cut off from the powerful presence of Christ and the Holy Spirit. The problem in the Galatian church was that some false teachers came behind Paul. And they persuaded the new Christians that in order to progress in their salvation, in order to go on to the next level, they must come in compliance with the Jewish law. Keep kosher rules, observe the Jewish holidays, and take the sign of circumcision. At first glance, it might seem that Paul is being very harsh on Judaism, But that would be to overlook the point of Galatians. Paul is extremely harsh on religion. In fact, he's most harsh not on Judaism, but on errant Christian religion. If you think about it, this letter isn't addressed to erring Jews, it's addressed to erring Christians. What is shocking is that every other kind of spirituality that is not authentic Christianity, Paul lumps together as part of the same invalid, impotent system that is under the sway of Satan and demons. Paul says that legalistic Christianity is no different than pagan idolatry. He says that Judaism without Christ, the Messiah, is no better than pagan idolatry. Islam, Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism, Hinduism, Animism, Native American, Spiritism, Mormonism, New Age religion, Scientology, Paganism, white and black witchcraft, Satanism, Atheism, secular humanism, they are all pieces of the same pie called religion. One of Paul's most provocative lines in the letter to the Galatians is that Both legalistic Christianity and Christless Judaism are akin to practicing witchcraft. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who has put the spell of religion over you? Formerly, when you didn't know God, you were enslaved to spirits who are not by nature God. How is it that you're turning again to those weak and worthless spirits? Do you want to be slaves to them all over again? How is religion akin to witchcraft? There's more than time allows for me to say on this subject, but let me throw out a couple things for you quickly. How is religion akin to witchcraft? For one thing, both are rooted in pride and rebellion. Rebellion traces its way all the way back to mankind's fall in the garden. That's where religion began. Adam believed Satan's lie that he could live, even thrive, without God. Ye shall not surely die. Ye shall be as God. So Adam followed Satan in rebellion against God's authority. And when things didn't turn out so well, Adam sewed fig leaves together in an attempt to try and cover his own nakedness in an attempt to try and fix what was broken. And listen to me, sowing fig leaves is the very essence of every kind of religion. It's man's attempts to fix himself. It's man's attempts to make himself presentable to God. Religion is self-reliance instead of repentance. Adam sowed fig leaves, and when God confronted him in the cool of the day, rather than humbly repenting rather than confessing rather than saying God I made a mistake please forgive me Adam shifted the blame 
In fact, he even implicated God himself, that woman you gave me. <laughs> you know, on the face of it, religion has the appearance of humility. People do costly acts of personal sacrifice, that they do acts of penance, they do acts of self-denial, acts of self-humiliation, extreme acts of religious devotion and service. But really, when you think about it, all of these things are just a manifestation of original pride. They're like sewing fig leaves together, trying to fix ourselves, trying to make ourselves presentable to God through our own efforts. If I attend enough church, if I recite enough prayers, if I light enough candles, if I teach enough Sunday school, if I do enough good deeds, if I give enough money to phase two, God will surely love me. Let me be crystal clear. Giving a lot of money to phase two will not do a thing to make God love you anymore. I, however, will be your friend for life. <laughs> Religion is self-reliance rather than genuine repentance. So the problem of rebellion is never legitimately addressed through the only means that God has prescribed. And God said to be in rebellion is to practice witchcraft. How is religion akin to witchcraft? Secondly, both reject legitimate authority, God's authority, and partner with and promote illegitimate authority. Pastor Nick is going to preach a great sermon someday about how the religious spirit operates in the church out of the book of Galatians. There's so much there. When Adam fell, he rejected God's legitimate authority and he came under Satan's illegitimate authority. That's why in the New Testament it says, without Christ we are under the dominion of darkness. And the religious spirit works in every generation to maintain that status quo. The religious spirit operates through human agents who refuse to submit to the authority of Christ and his church, and it empowers them with an illegitimate demonic authority. Paul marvels in the book of Galatians. He says that the source of these false religious teachers is not God who called you. Their source is the enemy. Paul says that their persuasiveness is so powerful in the body. It has so infected. It is so infiltrated that it has a demonic spiritual dynamic behind it. The religious spirit challenges and undermines the God-given authority of genuine fivefold ministers of the gospel. The religious spirit alienates converts from their legitimate spiritual fathers and makes them devotees of illegitimate fathers. Paul says, my dear children, I have labored for you as in childbirth. Have I now become your enemy? There was a time when you would have done anything for me. You would have torn out your own eyes and given them to me. But now these teachers, they have alienated you from us so that you'll become their followers instead. The religious spirit persuades people to desert Christ and come under bondage to a false system. Paul says, I'm astonished that so quickly you have deserted the one who called you by his grace and you're turning to another gospel that is no gospel at all. The religious spirit is expressly anti-Christian. It hates the cross of Christ. It hates the lordship of Jesus Christ. It hates the true church. It hates authentic followers. It persecutes authentic followers of Christ. Religion hates people who are free in Jesus. It hates joyful worshipers. Religion hates flag wavers and dancers and people who celebrate and who, women who bring their alabaster box of worship and lavish it on Jesus. Paul said the son born according to the flesh continually persecutes the one born by the power of the spirit. How is religion akin to witchcraft? Number three, both are focused on self-promotion and human recognition. Religion thrives on competitiveness. Paul talks in Galatians 1 about his life as a Jewish Pharisee. And he says he was very ambitious and competitive. He was proud that he was top of the class. He was proud that he had surpassed all of his peers in Judaism. He was proud of his position. You see, that is the atmosphere of religion. It is full of strife. It is full of jealousy. It is full of gossip. It is full of resentment. 
Religion measures oneself against others instead of against the righteousness of Christ. Religion flaunts spiritual accomplishments. It's focused on people-pleasing rather than on God-pleasing. Paul says in Galatians 1, Before I was a servant of Christ, I was a people-pleaser. Religion is focused on external appearances rather than inward realities. Jesus said to the Pharisees, You're like whitewashed tombs. You're white and clean on the outside, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. Religion loves human applause and rewards. Paul said, I labor in prayer for you that you'll become more Christ-like, but these religious teachers, to you, to, to them, you're just another notch in their belt. How is religion akin to witchcraft? Both seek control through manipulation. Religion loves to control people. Religion loves hierarchical structures. Religion loves positions and titles and visible symbols of authority, robes and stoles and hats and scepters and censers and thrones. Religion loves politics and bureaucracies. Religion manipulates people through fear, through intimidation, through superstition, through guilt trips. Religion also tries to control natural and supernatural forces even God through manipulation. You see, the heart of this letter is to contrast religion with authentic Christianity. Now, everyone knows the three R's of education, right? The three R's of education are reading and writing and arithmetic. I never got that last one, but... Looking at Paul's words in Galatians, I find three R's of authentic Christianity, and I want to share them with you quickly. Three R's of authentic Christianity. First this, authentic Christianity is not religion, but it is redemption through the cross of Christ. Paul said, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Redemption means to be freed from slavery through a purchase. On the cross, Jesus paid the price that secures our freedom. Paul wrote, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, religion, by being made a curse for us hanging on the tree. Listen to me. The cross is diametrically opposed to religion. The cross and religion are polar opposites to one another. Paul says in Galatians 5, the cross is offensive to religion. How so? Well, the cross is humiliating. The cross was humiliating for Jesus, and it's humiliating for us. The cross says three things that religion absolutely hates. First, the cross says, your sins are ugly. The cross was the bloodiest, most gruesome, most pitiful spectacle in human history. The Bible says it was so ugly, we hid our faces from him. Even God the Father turned his face away from the Son while he hung on the cross. Truthfully, we can't even bear to look at images that even vaguely approximate the real horror of the cross. But in the ugly spectacle of the cross, we are forced to look at the true ugliness of our own sin and to grieve and to repent. Just like Moses lifted up the bronze serpent in the wilderness so that the people could look up at it and acknowledge the ugliness of their own rebellion against God, Jesus on the cross forces us to deal with the ugliness of our rebellion. The cross says your addiction is ugly. The cross says your dishonoring your parents is ugly. Your lying is ugly. Your stealing is ugly. Your cheating is ugly. Your anger is ugly. Your critical, vindictive spirit is ugly. Second, the cross says you're helpless. The cross completely precludes self-reliance. It disqualifies me from contributing anything to my own salvation. And that's what irks religion the most. Religion wants to sow fig leaves. Religion wants to cover my own deficit. It wants to fix myself. But the cross doesn't allow that. Jesus paid it all. That means there's nothing left that I can contribute. 
What Jesus did on the cross, he accomplished without my help. The redemption that I've received, he has applied to my heart without my help. The cross removes every ground for boasting, and religion hates that. The cross requires total reliance on Christ and Christ alone for salvation, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his own mercy, he has saved us. Third, the cross says, you may only approach God on God's terms. How many times do I talk to people and we're having conversations out on the street about a religion and they say, I worship God my own way. <laughs> As if God has given any of us that right. Religion is rooted in rebellion and pride and disobedience. It's been convinced since the beginning that it can beat the system. Ye shall not surely die. Ye shall be as gods. Religion is predisposed to noncompliance. It is determined to find an alternate route. But the cross says there is only one way to approach God, and that is through the blood of his son, Jesus, the spotless lamb. Redemption is that moment. Listen. Redemption is that moment when what Jesus did on the cross becomes personally applied to me. Redemption is a moment when a spiritual transaction occurs. My sin, with all of its penalties, is transferred onto Christ, and Christ's righteousness, with all its rewards and benefits, are transferred onto me. Redemption is a moment when the Holy Spirit does an indescribable inner work, and I experience a spiritual rebirth. Redemption happens in a moment of faith. God causes the light of revelation to shine in our hearts. We become convicted of our own sin. We become convinced about Jesus. And in a moment of faith, we surrender our will to God. You know, that could happen anywhere at any time. It could happen in a room full of people like this one. It could happen at a table with friends. It could happen alone. For me, I was alone in my bedroom. For C.S. Lewis, the greatest Christian thinker of the 20th century, faith came to him one afternoon while he was riding in the sidecar of his brother Warney's motorcycle. He wrote, when we set out, I did not believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and when we reached the zoo, I did. Makes me wonder what kind of driver Warney was. <laughs> Maybe a bit like driving with Denise Harvison, I don't know. I've gotten saved a few times while my wife's been driving. <laughs> I'll never forget the glorious day that we closed on this property. We got this property under contract in the spring of 1998, but we didn't close until the fall of 1999. It took a year and a half to get zoning approval for phase one and for phase two. And in the process, we managed to change the zoning laws for the entire town of Greenwich that benefited every church. And during those 18 months, we learned everything there was to know about this property. We walked every bit of this property. We examined this property as thoroughly as anyone ever could. We paid for surveys. We paid for environmental studies. We paid to test the soil. We paid to test the water. We paid to drill test borings so we know what kind of rock is under the property and where it is. We paid to ensure that there are no Indian burial grounds underneath us or colonial battlefields. We paid to have every tree and shrub on this property identified and put down on a survey map. There was hardly a thing that we didn't know about this property, but it wasn't ours until we sat down at the closing table. We were free to examine it all we wished, but we had no rights to it. We weren't entitled to do anything with it until it became ours. At the closing table, our money, all of our money, was transferred into the owner's account. And the title was transferred into our name and then 1338 King Street was ours. As soon as the closing was done, I left Greenwich Avenue and I drove up. It was a glorious, glorious October day. And when I got here, Walt Jamroga was already here and 
Then a troop of Steve Gamble's men appeared out of the corn stalks and they were carrying two big logs on their shoulders. And the first thing that we did the moment this property became ours is we put up the cross that you see when you come in the driveway every time. <laughs> Remembering that, I can't help thinking about the difference between people who spend their whole life merely hanging out around church and those who have actually experienced redemption. Some people have learned pretty much everything there is to know about Christianity. They've examined it extensively. They're completely familiar with Christianity, but they've never sat down at the closing table. They never completed the transaction whereby their sins are transferred onto Christ and Christ's righteousness is transferred onto them. In Isaiah, God says, come to the bargaining table. Come, let's sit down, let's negotiate together. Here's my terms. You bring nothing, I bring everything. And though your sins be as scarlet, I will wash them whiter than snow. Take it or leave it. My greatest burden is that someone would grow up at Harvest Time Church or spend half his life at Harvest Time Church and know all about Christ but never come to the closing table. My deepest concern is that you would never experience that transaction called redemption and the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit that comes with it. My worst fear is that you would remain a son born according to the flesh amidst a room full of sons born by the power of the Spirit. Doesn't matter how long you've been around. Doesn't matter how often you've been around. Doesn't matter how much you've been involved. If you have never come to the closing table, all of this is just religion. It's impotent and it is of no more worth than pagan idolatry. Don't let that happen. Come to God's closing table. Come to the cross. Humble yourself before God. Confess that your sin is ugly. Confess that you're helpless and accept his terms. Three R's of authentic Christianity. Second this, authentic Christianity is not religion, but it is a love relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Paul says in Christ, the religious ritual of circumcision is meaningless. The only thing that matters is faith expressing itself through love. When Adam fell into sin, he experienced first a spiritual death. His love relationship with God was severed. He became ashamed and afraid of God, and he became God's adversary and all of us with him. But when we receive redemption... Our severed love relationship with God is restored. Listen, God did not purchase us merely so that we could become free agents. God purchases us so that we can become his own sons. Paul says at the appointed time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem us from under the law, religion, so that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because of redemption, we experience a bond of intimacy now with each person of the Trinity. We feel intimately connected to the Father. We feel intimately connected to the Son. We feel intimately connected to the Holy Spirit. We share a family bond with God that gives us an ultimate sense of security. You know, there are things that my kids never wonder or worry about because I'm their father and they're my children. My kids never wonder whether I'm going to share my very best with them. They never wonder whether I'm going to do everything I can to protect them. My kids never wonder whether or not they can approach me. Believe me, they feel very free to approach me at any time. Even when I'm dead asleep, they'll approach me. <laughs> my kids never wonder whether they can ask me for help. They never wonder if I'm going to stop being their dad because we've had a bad day in the discipline department. Some days are like that. We are blood. We are organically and inextricably connected to one another and nothing can change that. 
That's the kind of bond that we now share with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In God, adoption reaches whole new heights. It reaches supernatural heights because when God adopts us, we actually become born of God so that our connection with Him is beyond legal. It's beyond relational. Our connection with Him is actually organic. That's good preaching. And because we are His sons, we're secure in His love, free to love Him, free to trust Him, free to approach Him, free to ask Him for help. And because we're secure in His love, we're free to love others too. Faith expresses itself through love. Love for God, love for worship, love for God's people, love for God's house, love for God's mission in the world. Can I tell you the things that we do, everything that we do around here, we don't do as an exercise of religion, but as an expression of our love. Phase one was an expression of love for God from a group of people, mostly whom have gone on now. And phase two is going to be the expression of our love. Religion says you could never do enough to please God. But faith says I could never do enough to thank God for everything he's done for me. What's the greatest problem in the church today? It's not that believers have fallen into sin, but rather that they've fallen into religion. The greatest problem is that we've fallen into routine, into a rut of weekly rituals. We're just going through the motion, following tradition rather than the spirit. The greatest problem is that we participate for the sake of our kids because we think they need to have a good foundation, but we ourselves remain impervious to the Word and to the Spirit. We have become religious, and religion has put a kink in our hose, cutting off the flow of God's joy and of God's love. Sometimes the microphone cuts out. And my favorite joke is there's nothing worse than a Pentecostal with no power. <laughs> but that's actually quite wrong. Paul says you can have all the power in the world. There is nothing worse than a Pentecostal with no love. Because then all you are is irritatingly noisy. <laughs> Let's not spend a lifetime at harvest time only to turn out nothing but irritatingly noisy in the end, let's experience authentic Christianity, faith expressing itself through love. Three R's of authentic Christianity. Not religion, but redemption. Not religion, but relationship. Finally this, and you can smile because I really am closing with this. Authentic Christianity is not religion, but the righteousness that comes from God. Worship team, come help me. Beloved, listen to me. Religion is entirely powerless. Legalistic Christianity, Christless Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, whatever kind of religion you want to talk about, religion is completely powerless to put you in right standing with God or to make you righteous within. Paul says, through the Spirit, we eagerly await the righteousness that comes by faith. Redemption is a transaction of exchange. My guilt transferred to Christ, Christ's righteousness transferred to me. Redemption puts me in right standing before God. I can stand in front of Him fully exposed and not be ashamed. I need no fig leaves. The theological term for that is justified. God looks at me just as if I'd never sinned. Paul said that Christ's righteousness is literally put on us like a robe. And then the Holy Spirit transforms our heart. He changes our heart. He writes the law of Christ on our heart so that we are no longer guided by an external set of rules, but we're guided by an inner inclination from the Holy Spirit to do what is good and what pleases God. The Holy Spirit makes you into a Sheba and not a Rusty. Let me explain. 
you might know that Paul and I have something in common. I too, like Paul, am a converted hater of dogs. My heart has been stolen by a mangy dog named Jack. And I never thought I'd be a dog lover, but here we are. But when I was growing up, our neighbors across the street had two dogs. One was a cocker spaniel named Rusty. Rusty spent his days in the backyard, which had a fence all around it. Only Rusty was a master escape artist. Rusty was forever digging under the fence or finding a, a gap and a way through the fence. Or he even climbed up on things in the yard and jumped over the fence. No matter how hard our neighbors tried, they could never keep Rusty inside that fence. They, they built up the soil all around the bottom. They even put rocks where he tended to dig through. They covered the gaps in the fence with wire. They moved objects away from the fence so that he couldn't jump over, but Rusty always found a way out and ran all over the neighborhood. That neighbor happened to own a local lumber yard for a while. And when he sold the lumber yard, he brought home Sheba. Sheba was a German shepherd who had been trained as a guard dog, and they left her in the lumber yard at night. She was super responsive to our neighbor's commands. When Sheba came home, it only took him one day to boundary train her. Sheba spent her days lying on the front porch with no leash, with no chain, with no fence. When the mailman or the paper boy would come by, Sheba would leap off of the front porch and she would sprint towards the curb with her ears back, barking and snarling the whole way. But she would stop on a dime when she got to the curb. We always loved it when there was a new paper boy or a new mailman. What great entertainment. They would have a heart attack in the street out front with this dog barreling towards them. But you know, in the decade that that dog lived across the street from us, I never once saw her step over the curb. She was trained from within. And her master's voice was in her head. And she obeyed it whether he was there or whether he wasn't. Rusty had a fence, but no inner discipline. Sheba had inner discipline, therefore she required no fence. And that is precisely the difference between religion and authentic Christianity. Whether it's legalistic Christianity or Christless Judaism or any other system of belief or morality, religion is a fence. And no matter how high the fence, no matter how tight the fence, no matter how reinforced the fence, religion can never ever contain the wayward heart of man. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. You see, we are all born rusties at heart. But authentic Christianity is the Holy Spirit transforming us into a Sheba. We need no chains. We need no fences because our master's voice is in us and we always obey. Let's not spend a lifetime at harvest time as a rusty. Our wayward hearts always leading us again and again and again beyond the fence. Let's experience authentic Christianity through the Holy Spirit, eagerly awaiting the righteousness that comes by faith. Hopefully now you understand a little better the heart of the letter to the Galatians. Three R's of authentic Christianity. Not religion, redemption. Not religion, relationship. Not religion, but the righteousness that comes from God. Would you stand on your feet and would you give Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, a great big praise in this place today. Oh, come on, let's give Jesus a great big praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.